Welcome to Dr. Sam's Anatomy Classes. I am Dr. Rajan Mohsen. I am going to solve this question paper of MBBS First Professional Exam, Anatomy Paper 1. This question paper is of GSVM. Ganesh Shankar Vidyarthi Memorial, Medical College, Kanpur. This medical college is affiliated to CSJM that is Chhatrapati Shahuji Maharaj University Kanpur. Okay. This exam was held on 27th of January 2021. So now this question paper according to the new GMER MCI guidelines from 2019 onwards so this question paper is seen with three of three hours and 100 marks paper and there are 10 marks question clinical views then these are the short questions diagram based questions short questions again then enumeration questions and here this is the Question number six, which I'm going to solve, is about the multiple choice questions. So, question number one, there are like you know five questions of four marks each that makes it 20 marks. So, question number one is placenta is formed from decidua menstrualis, decidua basalis, decidua capsularis, decidua paraxalis. So, first just I have a revision here. This is the uterine cavity, right? And here, yeah, this uh, you know, this is my metrium, right? And outside the peritoneal covering will be the perimetrium, right? This is all covered, perimetrium. And on the inside, we have is the my endometrium. Now we will be talking about the endometrium. This endometrium, this endometrium is actually made up of three layers. So you know the lumen. Now the luminal surface. This is stratum compactum. This stratum compactum. Then the middle layer here is loose. Uh, you know filled with large vacuolated cells studded with glycogen and lipids in it. So this is stratum spongiosum. Right? And down below you have the basal cell layers. The basal layer, right? The basal layer is called stratum basale. Although, uh, you know, the secretive phase is the second phase after the proliferative phase and the second phase of this menstrual cycle is the secretive phase and that are like glands and, you know, the glands, uterine glands, they form. That is a part of menstrual cycle to be taught later on sometime. So the top two layers, like these two layers are shed off during the menstrual cycle or uh, in case of after birth. So these two top layers they are called, they are actually called the functional layer these two are called the functional layers of the endometrium now see what happens is like after the fertilization happens you know fertilization happens in the ampulla portion of this uh infundibulum most common uh, ampulla portion of this uh, fallopian tubes uh, most common side and then it travels down from this fallopian tubes into this uterine cavity and that takes around like six five to six days uh some books even write it like you know from six to twelve days and that's the time required uh, after fertilization to implantation so what i'm going to draw here is a cut section now uh, this is what i'm drawing is a cut section here so when you take a cut section here you will find that on the outside you will have this as the perimetrium and then you have is the myometrium right this is the myometrium the mus 
particular layer and then you drawing the wall and then the inner one is the endometrium so this is the endometrial layer i have drawn here this endometrium as i was telling in the secretive phase under the influence of those you know hcg that is the hcg hormone after fertilization which starts being secreted by this cnc shoot of blasts so normally also this is the maternal progesterone that maintains this uh, secretive phase where this endometrium becomes duggy, thick and glandular with more proliferation of blood vessels and all. That is that phase, the secretive phase, you know, it's enhanced after implantation. So, under the influence of HCG and maternal progesterone. Now, let's say there is an implantation here of the embryo. So this embryo, the outer layers will of course be the chorions, then you have the animal pole, the, the yolk sac, right? And then surrounding to that will be the splanchnopleuric layer and then the somatopleuric layer of the extra embryonic mesoderm. So this you are seeing is a developing blastocyst actually. The phase which gets implanted is called the blastocyst. So when it reaches the implantation here, you know, in just after five to six, uh, six days after, uh, you know, fertilization, some books write it as six to twelve days. Now what happens is when it is implanted, this already I told you is duggy and is loaded with a lot of vacuoles. This will be prepared like, you know, in a receptive phase for implantation would be those, you know, the corkscrew like gland or still uterine glands they will enlarge and glycogen and lipids will be accumulated there for this providing nutrition to the developing embryo until there is this placenta form and of course the spiral blood vessels they will dilate and will form sinusoids there on the metal side and what all the little changes are happening that's called residual reaction and the purpose of telling is like you know after around five days you now the implantation what happens that slowly and slowly that this blastocyst gets sunken inside like it gets buried inside the endometrium this after implantation actually now we call this endometrium in a better world we call it as decidua now what you see is endometrium which is now being called as decidua why decidua you know decidua is something which sheds off you have the milk teeth also called deciduous teeth there are plants which shed off during the autumn season so it's something which sheds off that's why this is called decidua because it sheds out of birth now the different names being given to this endometrium after implantation that's called decidua. The different names are, you know, this layer, uh, you know, between the developing embryo and the uh, maternal side, on, uh, you know, below to this embryo, this portion of this uh, decidua is called decidua basalis, right? This is called decidua basalis. And the portion of the decidua which covers this developing embryo on the luminal surface like a cap. So this is called decidua capsularis. While the rest of the decidua lying in the rest of the uterine cavity, this is called decidua parietalis. And this, of course, is the uterine cavity. So, what happens is, like, you know, with the course of the, you know, pregnancy, this embryo, of course, will enlarge and will reach to a fetus. And what happens is, gradually, around the third week, or oh, sorry, the third month, it will be because, you know, this will be pushed here, uh, you know, with the increasing size. Of the embryo this uterine cavity will you know it will 
compress and gradually decidua capsularis will fuse with decidua parietalis. So there is obliteration of the uterine cavity by the end of third month of pregnancy. Okay, so that, those were like the three layers of the decidua for you. These are related with pregnancy. And decidua menstrualis, not decidua menstrualis, is the decidua because that also is going to be shed. That's why it's also a decidua. And that is the second phase of the, you know, after ovulation, that uh, endometrium, again, it you know, starts preparing for, uh, you know, uh, hopefully if there is fertilization. So it was um, in the second phase of this menstrual cycle, that uh, endometrium which sheds off is called and in the form of menstrual flow blood uh, that's called decidua menstrualis now he have to tell that placenta is formed from so remember because here's the animal pole on where it is getting implanted so this portion here this portion of the this portion of the decidua over to which embryo is resting so between the embryo and the maternal surface this portion here is called decidua basalis and remember that decidua basalis is which is going to form the placenta okay so your answer here will be decidua basalis Let's move to the next question. Cartilage present in epiphyseal growth plate. Hmm. So, epiphyseal growth plate, you know that that's, it's a long bone where you have epiphyses both the sides and you have a diaphysis in between. The ends are called the metaphysis. And in between here you have is the growth plate. This growth plate is me is you know is also called physis or growth plate. Now this I have already told you there is a lecture uploaded in my playlist. You can see that is all about the going into the long bones and all the required you know important essential information about the long bones I've already uploaded. All the details that you can learn from there. So, by the way, I, let me tell you that this is made up of hyaline cartilage. Cartilage is an epiphysic growth plate. Epiphysic is hyaline cartilage. Before winding up, let me tell you the other examples in case they ask. Uh, so, important examples of hyaline cartilage will be hyaline cartilage examples, examples will be coastal cartilages, right? Coastal cartilages, then you have articular cartilage, right? And you have in the larynx, like in the larynx, you have thyroid. Thyroid cartilage, glucoid cartilage, erythinoid cartilage. So these are, you know, uh, made up of hyaline cartilage. And you remember that articular cartilage is not only a feature of you know, synovial joints, also in the secondary cartilage in the joints, the end of the bones they go on by articular cartilage made up of hyaline cartilage. Well, there is an additional fibrous, you know, fibrocartilaginous disc placed in between. So, these are a few examples, and remember the tracheal and the rings. Tracheal as well as the bronchial, uh, you know, bronchus. Trachea and bronchus. Bronchus means primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchus. Until it has a cartilaginous ring, then it's a bronchus. When it is not having a cartilaginous ring, then it's called bronchioles. So, nasal septum nasal cartilages right you know nasal septum and the little nasal cartilages they are also examples of 
hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage, examples of elastic cartilage. This important pinna is one good example, right? That is a auricle or the external ear, pinna. And this also it reaches, remember, it reaches to a little extent into the exploratory meters as well. And the elastic cartilage, remember the hyaline cartilage, other examples of the hyaline cartilage is the cartilaginous portion, cartilaginous portion, uh, portion of auditory tube, auditory tube as well as external auditory meters deep inside the cartilage of both of them is made up of hyaline cartilage but the pin on outside is made up of elastic cartilage then other examples of elastic cartilage uh, yes the laryngeal cartilages you know epiglottis epiglottis then you have cuneiform, cuneiform, corniculate, corniculate, and the apex, apex of arytenoid, arytenoid cartilages. So not the arytenoid because arytenoid itself is an example of hyaline cartilage, but the apices, the apex of the arytenoid cartilage then cuneiform cartilage corniculate epiglottis all of them example of elastic cartilage then fibrocartilage fibrocartilage the examples are you know uh, examples are uh, you know articular discs articular disc present in between the secondary cartilaginous joints like pubic symphysis, pubic symphysis, then manibro sternal joint, right, and uh, intervertebral joint between the bodies of vertebrae, and menisci, menisci of knee joint, labrum, labrum glenoid and acetabular labrum. So these are examples of fibrocartilage, but remember one thing important here that in TMJ, TMJ, if they ask, is important. It has been asked once that the interarticular structure that's there in this TMJ, which divides the joint into two chambers, that is not a fibrocartilage. It is a fibrous tissue. Why? Because it's a remnant of which muscle? Lateral pterygoid. So the disc present in TMJ is not fibrocartilage, it's a fibrous connective tissue. Got it? So that was some revision about different cartilages. Next, I mean, you know, here the answer, of course, is hyaline cartilage. That is, we have done answer. <laughs> Then we'll talk about non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium is seen in. Non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium is seen in thyroid gland, trachea, testis, tongue. So, uh, to remember this, to remember this, there are a lot many examples of stratified squamous epithelium. Remember that human body is like a you know tube human body is like a tube this tube has you know openings you know oral opening above anal opening down below right so like imagine like you're wrapping up like you know in your art and craft exhibitions what you used to do is to wrap that craft paper over a glass tumbler or something similarly you're wrapping this up with let's say skin so you're wrapping it with the skin the human body from all the sides right and when you are left with the edges of this paper you just fold it inside right we just fold the edges of the paper inside to cover up the margins right 
this is how uh, you know when you cover a wrap a tubular structure with a paper so now what you're seeing the human body is wrapped on all the sides by this thing and that is called skin right and skin the lining epithelium which we called it as stratified squamous keratinized stratified squamous keratinized epithelium right now the the same epithelium when it gets folded on inside like you know all the orifices present on the human body they have the same lining epithelium stratified squamous epithelium that gets invested on to inside of this uh, openings to a certain extent and that you have to remember so now this which goes inside this epithelium you're seeing which is folded on inside it is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium this is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium so i'm like telling you how to remember all the examples of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium <clears throat> So now start imagining what could be the examples. First of all, we'll talk about the oral cavity. So oral cavity may you can imagine the examples of non-keratinized epithelium is now we'll tell you, talking is about the examples of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So first of all is oral cavity, oral cavity, the lining epithelium gums, gingiva, hard palate, soft palate, tongue, I hope you got the answer now, tonsil, those surface of the tonsil which is protruding into the oral cavity. Uh, remember that's why tonsil is a partially encapsulated uh, lymphoid organ so tonsil okay one then you have uh, the oropharynx right the lining of cheeks cheeks on inside then uh, pharynx and esophagus so you got to know so the same epithelium which goes from oral cavity covering all the structures in the oral cavity and reaches down up to the esophagus right at the eso you know gastroesophageal junction there up till there it is this lining epithelium non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium now let's talk about other openings let's say now external auditory meatus the lining will be the same right although in like you know the uh, most disc uh, you know a uh, portion of this external auditory meatus towards the pinna that of course will be uh, skin but if you go deep inside it will be non keratinized and of course that will be hairy also hairy uh, you know um, to a certain extent then nasal vestibule nasal vestibule nasal vestibule is also called as nasal antrum nasal antrum or antrum this is the portion of the nasal cavity up till where you can reach your little finger into the nose that up till that portion is called nasal vestibular antrum and there you know we have this uh, stratified squamous non keratinized and those hairs are actually see you know vibrissae you know yeah vibrissae is different thing that's from the upper lips but these are the hairs on this nasal uh, vestibule so the lining cavity here also is the same thing now conjunctiva and cornea they of course are stratified uh, epithelium stratified squamous epithelium but they are modified because they have to be maintained transparency so cornea and cornea and conjunctiva 
they are modified you can say these are modified why modified they have to be transparent and they have other important functions but remember to tell you that because they are stratified and flattened cells on outside then uh, nose ho gaya ear ho gaya eyes ho gaya right then we talk about like you know vagina vagina the lining epithelium will be same stratified squamous non keratinized anal canal anal canal you can remember that this anal canal if you talking is about anal canal uh, in a very short very diagram i'm telling you it is divided let's say into three portion right uh, you know there is this pectinate line right there is pectinate line the upper one third of the uh, anal canal then you have is the middle one third of the anal canal and the lower one third of the anal canal so the different epithelium in the different three portions of the anal canal so the lowest portion that is the lowest one third is by skin that is scary uh, uh, you know hairy and it is keratinized uh, stratified stratified squamous epithelium keratinized that is a hairy skin on the lower one third of anal canal then in the middle one third it is as i told you because it's a folding of the same epithelium that has to be non keratinized so this is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in the middle one third of the anal canal and this is called pectin right deep inside you find is the oh you know the uh, you know the superficial veins venous plexuses but the upper one third that is like above to the pectinate line and remember what is like separating what is separating uh, the uh, middle and lower one third and and this is called pectin pectinate line this is called pectinate line so upper one third of the anal canal the lining epithelium will be stratified columnar epithelium stratified columnar epithelium in on the upper one third of the anal canal so we were talking about the example of stratified squamous epithelium vagina remember the entire length of vagina will be by same even the outer surface of external os right including the uh, cervix cervix the outer surface external os that is again by stratified remember that pap smear that you do for this endometrial you know cervical biopsy so we look over those like uh, shedding of those flattened squamous cells from the cervix then what is here urethra in females actually the you know this female urethra is homologous to prostatic urethra in males and females urethra they do not open on to the outside they rather opening into the vestibule of you know vestibule of the vulva so uh, the lining epithelium in female of urethra, urethra will be transitional epithelium and in case of males because that's homologous right so the prostatic urethra in males again will be same as transitional epithelium but uh, the portion of the male urethra that is membranous urethra and the penile urethra that will be lined by stratified or uh, pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium because that is the pathway of the sperm is right so right from this you know ejaculatory portion if you ask it for instance you know that is the vas deferens seminal which you know epididymis fasciae ferentia gyridymis ductus def uh, vas deferens seminal vesicles ejaculatory ducts then penile urethra membranous urethra penile urethra all this is the pathway of the ejaculation so that will be lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium but as i was telling you the examples here about the folding of the skin into the orifices so remember one other example that is left out is the terminal urethra 
टर्मिनल यूरिथ्रा इन मेल्स टर्मिनल यूरिथ्रा इन मेल्स आल्सो इज सेम स्टेडिफाइड कॉमर्स नॉन कैरेटनाइज एपिथेलियम so i hope i have given you enough of information about this epithelium in case you get different questions with so many examples you can solve them and here the answer which you uh, you know which you mark here is down so this will be the answer now let's move to the next question kairos occupying broca's speech area is so you know this is the suprolateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere right and here you have is the central or the rolandic sulcus you have precentral sulcus you have postcentral sulcus right and these are the gyrus is different you have superior and inferior frontal uh, sulcus divide into superior middle and inferior frontal gyrus right superior temporal sulcus this is the inferior temporal sulcus right and this is how you know you, it gets divided you have this is axial sulcus you have lunate sulcus you know and little bit of the paratoxipetal sulcus surface and here you divide it into superior inferior parietal lobules <coughs> angular gyrus this one is angular gyrus marginal gyrus different names of them i'm not going to really i mean you know revise it will take it will take a time so actually speaking this sulcus you know this sulcus is called the stem of lateral sulcus why stem because it is dividing into three rami so this point where the stem of lateral sulcus divides into three ramas it's called Sylvian point, Sylvian point, and where it does it lies under, it lies you know the surface anatomy. This will be the under to the terion, right deep to the terion. You find is the Sylvian point where this stem of lateral sulcus divided into anterior horizontal sulcus, right? I am using a different pen. So this is the stem. this is the anterior horizontal this is the anterior ascending and this is the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus so remember post this one this posterior ramus jo hai this is posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus this is an example of operculated sulcus operculated sulcus why because if you pull it down deep inside you will find there is a fresh different type of gyrus you know this cortex cerebral cortex and that's called insula so this is an example of operculated sulcus and you know this lateral sulcus is an example of secondary sulcus this is an example of secondary sulcus Lateral sulcus. Why is it an example of secondary sulcus? Because because it is formed because of external factors, and that is the lesser wing of sphenoid. Because of the push of the lesser wing of sphenoid, that get folded inside. So this is example of uh, stem of lateral sulcus is example of secondary sulcus. Now you get different areas formed here. This is called a or pars orbitalis. this portion below to this anterior horizontal is called pars orbitalis this is pars orbitalis and this portion between the anterior horizontal and vertical this is called pars triangularis and this portion here between the anterior ascending and the posterior ramus this portion is called pars opercularis right so now talking about the areas the broca's area that is in question right so we talking about broca's area speech area so remember pars triangularis here you find is area 44 and this is 45 
this sparse triangularis and parts opercularis together form the Broca's area. Now this is called Broca's area. Okay. And once again, because what they have asked in question is about the different uh, gyrus. So this is the gyrus that they have asked. Remember, it is a part of this gyrus. Which gyrus is this? You no know, superior, middle, and inferior. Inferior. What? Frontal gyrus. Right. So Broca's area speech area will be lying on the inferior frontal gyrus. The rest of the information is in addition for your further questions. Sometimes you might ask in addition different other things. Now next question is the last question. Which of the following in uh, nerve is involved in fracture neck of humerus? You know, whenever the nerve comes in an intimate contact to a bone, there are chances of nerve compression, right? Neuropraxia type of injury, like there is a transient type of injury that's neuropraxia due to nerve compression. And of course, the nerve injury is also very much possible because they're closely intimately related to a bony surface, it's a hard surface. So here, what you're seeing here, I'm drawing is humerus, right? So this is humerus and you have the capitulum, you have the medial and the lateral flange of the trochlea, right? And uh, let's say this, uh, you know, of course, like behind that, so I'm drawing it in dotted lines, the radial group on behind. And this is the anatomical nerve. This is the uh, lesser tubercle, this is the greater tubercle and the intertubercular sulcus indicator. Now, the two necks, remember, the surgical neck is, this neck is the surgical neck and this is the anatomical neck along the articular surface, that's the point of attachment capsule and the surgical neck. And the morphological neck, if you take a longitudinal section, the corticocasillus junction is called the morphological neck of humerus. Um, nerve involved in fracture. So remember the three nerves, there are three nerves intimately related to the humerus. One is this nerve. This nerve winds because I have drawn is uh, the anterior view. This diagram what you're seeing is right humerus. Anterior view right humerus anterior view. So this is the course of which nerve? This nerve is axillary nerve. Axillary nerve. It winds along the posterior uh, surface of the surgical neck of humerus under the cover of deltoid and it runs along with posterior circumflex humeral artery. Okay. <clears throat> then there is a nerve which runs into this radial groove. This nerve is, radi is radial nerve. This radial nerve actually, you know, when it emerges here, it actually there is this intermuscular septum. So it perforates this intermuscular septum in the mid of the shaft and then it descends into the anterior compartment. Got it? So this is the course of radial nerve. And radial nerve, where it is in intimate relation? In the radial groove in the posterior mid shaft of humerus. There is another nerve which winds, behind, which runs below to this medial epicondyle of humerus. And this is, uh, you know, uh, ulnar nerve. This is ulnar nerve. And this was radial nerve. So when it descends down behind the medial epicondyle, there will be superior in, you know, in case they ask the, you know, associated vessels also, you can write here, it will be associated with posterior circumflex humeral artery. And here it will, this radial nerve will be 
running along with profunda brachii profunda brachial artery profunda brachial artery and ulnar now will be running along with superior inferior ulnar collateral arteries right so then when it descends down this also has been asked here you find is uh, ulna right there is ulna placed here attached to this trophic notch and there was this muscle coming origin from this medial epic condyle that's a common origin and uh, common flexor origin and from the upper me uh, upper medial surface of the ulna the two points of origin and this muscle is flexor carpi ulnaris so remember how ulnar nerve reaches the forearm remember it passes behind the medial epic condyle then it enters into the forearm by passing between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris okay so these are the three nerves and what you know there is a deep fascia on behind which forms a tunnel for these vessel for this nerve and the tunnel through which this ulnar nerve passes behind the medial epicondyle is called cubital tunnel this is cubital tunnel okay so uh, radial nerve if it gets injured here you know uh, axillary nerve inge sorry axillary nerve if it gets injured here what will happen the paralysis of this deltoid there is minor of course flattening of shoulder and all drooping of this you know this flattening of the inability in abduction overhead abduction of the uh, you know inability to abduct from 15 to 90 degrees radial nerve what will happen there will be wrist drop right saturday night palsy remember is related crutch paralysis in saturday night so saturday night and crutch paralysis remember both are related with radial nerve people generally get confused that uh, you know crutch with axillary remember crutch and saturday night paralysis both are related with injury of radial nerve in the radial groove and that leads to wrist drop ulnar nerve passing below the cubital then behind the medial condyle is called cubital tunnel syndrome now what will happen here there will be uh, you know they will of course be partial claw hand but the clawing will be less than in the guin's canal when ulnar nerve reaches the wrist joint it passes or you know crosses the wrist through this guin's canal so compression of ulnar nerve at the wrist is called Guin's canal syndrome and compression of ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle is called cubital tunnel syndrome the difference is the in you know the deformity in both case of ulnar nerve uh, compression is uh, partial claw hand uh, but clawing in cubital tunnel syndrome will be less or relieved why because when there is you know from here when it will be running actually uh, uh, it's compression here so what happens flexor carpi ulnaris and uh, you know there's one and a half muscle innervated by ulnar nerve in the front of forearm flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial two tendons of flexor digitorum profundus so they will also be paralyzed so what will happen remember the ip joints right the rp joints are actually flexed because of this flexor digitorum profundus you know so if this is being paralyzed the clawing will be relieved right clawing will be relieved on the little finger and ring finger side so this is called ulnar paradox remember this word ulnar paradox ulnar paradox is when there is uh, injury behind the because why why is this called paradox because normally it is presumed that a proximal nerve injury is is leads to more disastrous deformities and which lead to more disabilities but here what is happening that a proximal nerve injury is relieving and you know it providing a better uh, livelihood to a patient 
so that's why it's called ulnar paradox so i have told you not enough things now in case if they ask one more thing they are adding to this diagram that which nerve in the arm is not in intimate relation to humerus so the answer will be what will be the answer which nerve in the arm is not in intimate relation to humerus so remember musculo cutaneous nerve and median nerve these are the two nerves in the arm which are not in contact to humerus got it so these are the two nerves in the arm not in intimate relation to humerus muscular cutaneous and median nerve so which of the following nerve is involved in fracture neck of humerus obviously if there is a fracture here right neck of humerus if it fracture what nerve will be injured of course the answer will be which nerve answer will be axillary nerve fracture neck of femur sorry neck of humerus so this is done have you understood okay good luck